Well, this is the, uh, the seventh message in a series that I've been preaching and teaching about the kingdom of glory. And even in the process of teaching and preaching this, I've faced a number of challenges uh, in our business, in my health, in our family, in our ministry, in our finances, and in my faith. And the devil does not want you to know who you are. He doesn't want you to come into a revelation of who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. He comes to kill, to steal and to destroy. He is a liar and a thief and he will do anything to keep you from an understanding of your identity because if you walk in your true identity as a son or daughter of God, he cannot control you. He cannot... Uh, make you stray from the path that God has for your life. You can live under an open heaven no matter what your circumstances try to tell you. It's a question of identity. And you were created for direct personal relationship with God, walking in direct communication with his spirit. That's what every human being is created for, direct personal relationship with God. And my role as a pastor or an apostle's role or a prophet's role, a teacher, the evangelist, anyone in fivefold ministry is not appointed to be an intermediary between you and God. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man and that's Jesus Christ. He's the mediator of the covenant. What the devil tries to do is replace that personal relationship with a belief system that relies on rituals, that relies on outward observances instead of personal relationship. And my role is to equip you so that you come into your identity and walk in that direct personal relationship with God. And throughout this series, I've talked about the danger of mixing our understanding of the covenant of the law with the covenant of grace. And we can see that this stems from a poor understanding of the new covenant. And in fact, many churches preach a mixture of the two, and all it leads is to the watering down of your identity. You can't live under the law and under grace. You can be in one or you can be in the other. So now we come to what is perhaps the most important understanding or revelation that you can have of the covenant of grace. We need to understand that God did not make the new covenant with you. He made it with Jesus. And that's a very, very important distinction to understand. That was the purpose of Jesus' death, burial and resurrection. By paying the price for the sin that separated us from a holy God, he became the mediator of a covenant of grace. Why is this distinction so important? That the covenant was made between God and Jesus and not God and us. Because we as sinful men and women, could never meet God's requirement of perfection. We could never meet the demands of holiness that would reconcile us back to God. The fulfillment of that covenant that we are under is not dependent on you. It is dependent on Jesus and he's already fulfilled it. The fulfillment of the covenant is not dependent on you. That's the whole purpose. It's dependent on Jesus and he's already fulfilled every requirement. This is crucial because if we could not meet God's standard for holiness, for perfection in thousands and thousands of years of human history 
we certainly cannot meet or fulfill it now. Are we agreed on that? Are we agreed that we are imperfect human beings? He fulfilled the covenant of the law when he gave up his spirit on the cross and said, it is finished. And then when he rose from the grave, he abolished it. At the same time, he paid the price for all of us in to enter into a new covenant paid for and guaranteed by the blood of Jesus, enabling us to walk in relationship with God. And we enter that covenant by faith and by completely surrendering our lives to Jesus. But the fulfillment of the covenant is not dependent on you. It's not dependent on me. It's dependent on Jesus. And he already fulfilled it. Now that should be the most freeing message you ever hear in your life. Because it puts an end to works. God did not make a covenant with you. He made it with Jesus and it's Christ in us that lives. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's no longer I that lives, as my wife quoted during communion. It's Christ that lives in me, and he's perfect. What happened in the Garden of Eden? We who had never even yet been born had the sin of Adam imputed to us right that's the basic doctrine of the fall of man that we inherit that fallen nature even though we were not born yet yeah what happened at the cross we who had never even yet been born born had the righteousness of God imputed to us before we had sinned the cross undoes the garden the cross puts us back in relationship with God. For the perfect solution of grace to be perfect, all of my past, present and future sins have to have been forgiven. Consider this, that 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected from the grave... He was paying the price for sins that had not yet been committed. True? Therefore, the sins that I commit in my future, the price has been paid for those sins, and I just appropriate that forgiveness by faith. It's one thing to agree with this in your mind, it's another to walk in it. And I'm laying down a theological platform for our revelation today. Romans 4.15 says that where there is no law, there is no sin. Who gave us the law? God. If God gave us the law and the law does not deal with sin, why did he give it? to expose our inability to meet his requirement for holiness, to expose the need for a saviour to save us from our sinful nature and then to meet that need, to meet that requirement of perfection. God must have a perfect solution pointed to by the law or he is denying his own perfection and his own promise. If you study the covenant of the law, you will discover that if you were to meet every requirement of the law, God would regard you as perfect. But no man could meet that requirement. So if the law is perfect and we cannot meet it and God is perfect, he must have a perfect solution to this dilemma. And that solution is the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus. So the covenant of grace is not perfect if it must be added to.
So, if I have received Jesus as my Lord and Saviour, if I am a new creation, as the Bible teaches me, if I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, how long does that last? Is our salvation, the finished work of the cross, only valid from one confession of sin to the next? If so, then our salvation is up to us, not God. Do you guys see where I'm going with this? Jesus has paid the price for my sins, my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins. If that covenant is perfect... It can't be added to. I can't add my holiness to the perfection of the work of the cross. So what I'm asking then is, once I receive Jesus as my Lord and Saviour, is the finished work of the cross that's been accomplished for me only valid from now, the point that I receive Jesus, to the next time that I sin and confess it? No is the correct answer, because if it's only valid until the next time I sin and confess, then my salvation is up to me, right? It's up to me to confess it, otherwise I'm not forgiven. I know this is kind of heavy theology, but we need to understand something, that the work of the cross is absolutely complete. Once and for all, Jesus Christ has dealt with the question of sin in our lives. If our salvation is up to us, it becomes a work, not grace. Because then I'm saying that God is standing up there with a scorecard. And he's listing my sins down every day. And he's putting a black mark against those that I have not yet confessed. And whether or not I am completely forgiven is dependent on whether my scorecard matches his scorecard. Do you guys get this? So if God's marking down all my sins on this side and I'm marking all my sins down on this side and I've got a couple left on my list that I have not yet confessed to, then my salvation is dependent on me because I have to confess it to be forgiven. And that becomes a work, not grace. In Hebrews 10 verses 11 to 17... The Bible says that, and he's talking here about the old system of sacrifice, that every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, everybody say forever, Your sin, your past, your present, your future sins have all been dealt with forever. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. His work's done. He sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified all my sins past present and future have been paid for i am called into covenant relationship with god through my faith in jesus with full assurance that everything lost in the garden of eden by the fall of man has now been restored do you want to receive Every blessing that it is possible for you to receive under the covenant of grace. Yes? Do you want to walk under an open heaven? Because the blessings of Abraham come on everybody who comes into this agreement with God, the new covenant. I'm going to give you two revelations today. The number one revelation that you need... To walk under an open heaven, to truly come into a covenant of grace, 
is that you must come into agreement with God that you cannot earn that which has already been freely given. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? If me and my wife go out for dinner with, say, Barry and Lyndall, and we go there with the expectation that we're going to pay our share of the bill, and then Barry sneaks off to the cash register and he decides he wants to bless me, so he pays the bill. I want to tell you that the restaurant owner is going to think I'm a bit of an idiot if I go up and try and pay the bill again. The debt's been cancelled, right? The bill has been paid. That's as plain as I can put it. And in fact, if you want to take that analogy a bit further, Barry's gone to the cash register and he said to the guy, you know what, any time these people come into this restaurant again, here's some money to cover that as well. We're going for lunch after this. <laughs> Do you get my point? <laughs> we, make, we make this covenant stuff really complicated, but this is a concept that anybody can understand. If you want to walk under an open heaven, if you want all the blessings of Abraham to come upon you, if you want to walk through your life in confidence and assurance that you can stand before God at the end of your life and he's not going to be pointing out all your faults because he doesn't even remember them, if you want that confidence, you need to come into agreement with God. You need to come into an agreement with God that you cannot earn what's already been paid for. It's as simple as that. But we've been taught that plus a bit more. We've been taught that We have to add to what's already been paid for. We get taught that our good standing with God is dependent on our tithes. How many times a month we come to church? <laughs> how many times we come to church? How many times, uh, how much we put in the offering plate? How much we pray? How much we worship? How much we read the, the Word of God. All of those things are good things for the Christian life. But the motivation for them must come from our revelation that God does not require us to do them for Him to be pleased with us. And when we get that revelation, we start reading the Word, we start praying, we start worshipping, we start giving more because we have this incredible understanding that my sin, which was as black as charcoal, has now been made as white as snow. Therefore, I want to give to him. Not because I owe him something, because that debt's been paid, but out of appreciation, out of love. This revelation will make you fall in love with God. Now, if you want the terms, the legal terms of the covenant, here we go. By grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There you go. That's the terms of your covenant. You come into agreement with God. You understand that, yes, I'm a sinful person. I give my life to you and I come into this incredible covenant where God pours out his blessings and mercy on me. It has nothing to do with how much I fast, how much I give, how much I tithe, how much I pray, how much I study, how much I worship, how much I intercede or even how many times I attend church. I will do those things more often because as I come into an understanding of covenant relationship with God, I understand that, that you people are my brothers and sisters and that we need to have fellowship together and that God has commissioned us to do a great thing, which is to tell other people about the free gift of salvation. We cannot add to the finished work of the cross. Our works cannot save us because our faith already has. 
Now, I've been hammering this for, I don't know how many messages, well, this is the seventh message, but I've been hammering this for a number of weeks. And as I've been coming into this greater revelation of how we've mixed the law and grace together, I've been observing myself. Because the danger of this message is, if you say to somebody, you don't owe anything to God and you, know, you can do whatever you like, <laughs> which is not what I'm saying. But people can misappropriate the strength of that message and move into works of the flesh, if you like, in, in, in the sense that you can go into this place where you think, I can do whatever I like now because I've already been forgiven. But as I've observed myself, I've observed something in me which I think my wife will probably affirm to you that I don't struggle to get up in the middle of the night to, to study the word of God or to pray or to intercede, that this revelation makes me hungrier for God and more fulfilled in God at the same time. Am I telling the truth, honey? <laughs> I'm asking you a straightforward question, honey. I'll take you for dinner, but I don't know if Barry will pay for it, okay? <laughs> True or not? True, thank you. Now it sounds like a bribe, though. <laughs> so the first revelation that I need is I need to come into agreement with God that I cannot earn my salvation. He said it. I'm going to agree with it. Thank you, Lord. I can give up my striving, I can give up my legalism, I can give up my empty religious works, I can give up my straining to perfect myself because God has already done it for me. This has everything to do with knowing who we are in Christ, who Christ is in us and walking in that identity. Now Paul goes on to say, Ephesians 2 verse 10, after he says that by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, he says, uh, Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Remember that whoever is in Christ is a new creation. So I'm created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's already set up stuff for you to do. You don't have to struggle with works of the flesh and try and work out what it is you have to do to please God because we are designed to have direct personal relationship with God through His Holy Spirit and God wants to speak to you more than you want Him to speak to you, if that makes sense. He desires close, intimate relationship with us, but our religion gets in the way. Because when you get into a works mentality where you think you have to earn favour with God, all you're doing is pushing him away. It's like a football player <laughs> who gets the pass on the wing and decides he can win the rest of the game by himself. See, this is where... The rubber meets the road, as they say. I come into agreement with God. I accept his perfect gift of grace. And now I have a life to live within that covenant that I have with God. And we know that God says of us that the offering, the sacrifice of Jesus has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The second revelation that we need, the first one is we need to come into agreement with God that we cannot earn what's already been freely given to us. The second one, the second revelation that we need to come to has to do with the last part of that verse because the first part of it sounds great. By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Okay, so that tells me that even though in God's eyes I have been perfected forever, there is an ongoing work of God in my life called sanctification. We're in a continual state of being sanctified, being purified, being transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So how do I become sanctified 
without getting into works because there's this tension. How do I resolve the tension between faith and works? And doesn't the Bible say that faith without works is dead? In fact, I will read you the passage. James 2, 14 to 26. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you not want to know, do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? The scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. What I want you to see here is that within all the examples of faith laid out for us in the Bible, there is a process at work. God comes with direct personal revelation to a man or woman and asks them to step out in faith in response to God. That man or woman of God responds to the word of God, and I use the charismatic term rema, the direct personal word of God. We're not talking about the Bible as a written work. We're talking about the direct personal word of God and does what God asks them to do. That's the works that he's talking about here. When he says that... Uh, When it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Let me explain to you what this means. Abraham is sitting there in an ancient city of Iraq, minding his own business, and God comes with a personal revelation to him and says, I want you to leave this city. I want you to go to a land that I'm going to lead you into. It's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. Your descendants will be as the sand on the seashores. I'm going to bless you and in your seed all nations will be blessed. This incredible promise. Would Abraham have received that promise if he just sat on his butt and never went anywhere? Would we have the example of Isaac? God comes to Abraham and he says, Oh, you know how I promised you a son? I promised you a son and after many years and many trials and you stuffing it up by sleeping with your maid and producing another son and all the things that you've done. You know that son that you finally got, you and your wife Sarah, that... That, that I proved my faithfulness through. With that son, I want you to take him up to this mountain and sacrifice him. So Isaac, on the journey to the mountain, with the wood on his back, right? Which is a picture of Christ with the cross on his back going up the same mountain, by the way. Isaac turns to Abraham and he says, Father, where's the sacrifice? Where's the ram? And Abraham says, God himself will provide the sacrifice. So I want you to see this. That's faith with works, right? 
Because God comes to Abraham and says, you know that son that I gave you, but I promise I want you to sacrifice him. What extraordinary faith Abraham had to say, I am going to obey to the point of death. And I will see the salvation of our God. He takes his son. He tells him God will provide the sacrifice himself. He goes up on this mountain. He is at the point with the knife raised like this to kill his own son at God's command. And bang, he gets the revelation from the angel of God. There's the ram caught in the thicket to be the sacrifice. Abraham was responding in faith to the personal word of God to him. He was not living out of a set of rules and regulations that says X amount of prayer, X amount of worship, X amount of church attendance, tithing offerings, hospital visits will please God. They're living out a submitted, surrendered life. And out of that submitted, surrendered life, God is appointing works for them to do, which they can only step into out of faith. If you can fulfill, if you think you can fulfill anything that is a work that is pleasing to God by yourself, you're operating out of a spirit of religion. Because anything that has value in the kingdom of God must have that mixture of faith and God's presence enabling the work to be completed. When I witness to somebody and they come to Christ through a word of knowledge, it's my obedience to the Rema word of God coming to me and saying to me, this is what the issue is in this person's life and I speak into their life, they receive it and they receive Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, that's me responding to uh, the Word of God that's come into my heart. I reveal it to them and I've done my work. I haven't bashed them over the head with the Bible. I haven't told them what a hopeless sinner they are and how if they don't clean up their lives and get into church, then they're going to hell. The thing that I'm discovering is that the more I commit my way to him, the more I surrender my life to him, the more that God will release faith in me and the more that God will speak to me and the more that God will allow me to uh, be used for his glory. The first revelation I said that we need is that we cannot pay for, we cannot earn something that has already been freely paid for. The second revelation that I need in my life is that my life is no longer my own. It is now completely surrendered to Jesus. In a few minutes, uh, Moses is going to be baptized in this baptismal font here. And what he's doing is he's identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is that when he goes down in that water, the old man is put to death. And the life that he now lives, he lives in Christ Jesus who gave himself for him. That means his life is dead. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And out of that place of surrender comes a heart that, want, that just longs for more of the presence of God. And a heart that longs for the presence of God is a heart that's open to Him. And it's open not just to transformation, but to the works of God that He's already appointed for you to do. The more room you make for God, the more He'll use you. The more room you make for God, the more He'll transform you. And these things work together. When he asks you to do something that's outside your own ability to do. When he asks you to pray for somebody who needs miraculous healing. 
And the doctor says, well, nothing can be done about this. And you pray in obedience and that person is healed. God gets the glory and you get more faith. And that opens you up to more of his Holy Spirit. When God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Abraham knew it made no sense to the natural mind. But his response was in faith and trust that God would make right something that was impossible in the natural. So Abraham believes God and it was accounted to him for righteousness because he demonstrated for God that he believed him by stepping out in faith. It still all comes back to faith, does it not? Abraham acted out of response to the Holy Spirit. And a surrendered life will always have this characteristic. God will ask me to step out in faith, in obedience, into the impossible. Every time I do, I become more separated to God for his purposes. That's the process of sanctification. Sanctification means that we are being made holy. Holy means to be separated to God. Every time that I uh, step out in faith, Out of a surrendered heart. Yes, God, you tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. Every time I do that, in obedience, I become more holy because the work of the Holy Spirit has been given room to move. We have the first revelation that I come into agreement with God. That I cannot earn, this is probably the fifth time I've said this, but we need to hear it again and again and again. I cannot possibly earn what has already been paid for. I can only receive it by faith. Revelation 2. When I come into agreement by faith with that first concept, That everything that I've ever done wrong, everything I ever will do wrong, has been paid for. When I come into that revelation, and when I step out in faith and I say, Okay, okay, God, I'm giving my life to you. That's step two. I surrender my life to Jesus for his purposes. When I do that, what I've done is I've laid myself, my old self, down under the water of baptism, as it were. I come out. In a new revelation, that it's no longer I that lives, it's Christ that lives in me. And so now I say, Jesus, do what you want in and through me. As I step out in faith, he reveals the works that he wants me to do. And yet it won't be me that's doing them, it's Jesus. So what's happening here? My faith is growing. I'm being further sanctified separated to the purposes of God, and God gets the glory. We're going to go from this series that I've been preaching about the kingdom of glory and the revelation of grace and getting rid of the spirit of religion out of the things that we do. We're going to go from that probably straight into a series about identity because We need a revelation in our hearts of the possibilities of a life completely surrendered to God. There is a wave of the Holy Spirit that has already started being poured out across the earth that God wants to pour through us pour into us and then through us. And if we can just get a handle on those two things, if we can just get the revelation that we can't earn anything from God, the salvation, healing, deliverance, restoration, everything that we long for out of the Christian life, If we can understand that is a work of grace, a work of the Holy Spirit that we can't earn. And if then we can just come into agreement with our first decision, 
when we repented and were baptized and we changed our thinking so that our thinking began to be aligned with God, we will walk in the sort of miracles, signs and wonders that we read about all the time in the book of Acts. The Bible teaches me that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. And we are all members of the latter house. The latter reign of the Holy Spirit is upon us. I want it to rain on me. I want to be filled up to overflowing. And out of that overflow, I would like the Holy Spirit to be poured out through me to others. Amen. Arthur, could you get Mosa to come down, please? And we're going to have a baptism in a minute. You know, I don't believe uh, I don't believe in people getting baptized. You know, two or three times in their life. I, I know that people sometimes do it. There was people on our trip to Israel that got baptized for the second time because they really wanted to be baptized in the Jordan River. So I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. But once you've, um, by faith, received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've gone down into the waters of baptism, um, then you've done what the Bible requires of you to come into relationship with God. You've repented, you've believed, you've uh, been baptized, you've come out of the waters into newness of life. However, I believe that repentance, which means, remember, metanoia, the Greek word uh, for, for repentance is metanoia, means a change of mind. I believe repentance is a day-to-day -day prospect in the, in, the, in the life of every believer. In the sense that every morning I have the opportunity, the Bible says that His mercy is in you every morning, Every morning, I have the opportunity to come before God and say, God, I surrender my life to you. I invite you to do whatever you want in my life today. And that's just as good as being baptized all over again, is it not? Because you're just presenting yourself before God. So I invite you. We're going to have a fire tunnel out of, out of here. I'm believing that Mosa gets baptized in the Holy Spirit today. Remember... Um, when Peter preached the gospel for the first time, he said, Repent and be baptized and you will receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're going to believe that Moser is baptized in the Holy Spirit today. As we gather around the waters of baptism, I want to invite every single one of us, just in our hearts, just say this, God, I surrender my life to you afresh today. Do with me whatever you want. If you mean it in your heart, I'm telling you, God's going to give you bigger faith challenges than anything you've read in the Word of God because He does not change. Amen? He always gives us more than we can handle in a sense, in a faith sense. I'm not talking about temptation. I'm talking about faith. He gives us things to do that we cannot do in our own strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.